Can you imagine what the world would look like if we could understand what animals had to say? If we could speak their language? A place that not only understands the heartbeat of animals, but that shows them love, care, and kindness is the Oakville and Milton Humane Society. The main focus of the Oakville and Milton Humane Society is to help animals. We find lost animals and reunite them with their families. We take in animals that no longer can stay in their homes and find new homes for them. We rescue animals that are in trouble in our community. We investigate allegations of cruelty and neglect. And so we're here to be a resource to our community, both the animals and the people. The animal species that we tend to get here, for the most part, are dogs and cats. But what people don't realize is that pretty much anything that walks, flies, swims, crawls, and needs assistance in our community could come in. So that has included things as large as ostriches and as small as fish. So when animals come to us, they come to us in a variety of ways. And some of them, however, um, emotionally have been through very bad experiences with people. They're scared. They don't know what to expect. They're closed because they haven't had a positive relationship with humans. The Humane Society often takes in animals that have had bad physical or emotional experiences with humans. They focus on rehabilitating these animals before finding them loving, forever homes. These animals might be scared or in pain and will display that in their body language. They might be trembling, keeping their ears down, turn their heads away and sometimes even growl when people approach them. It can take a lot of time and patience to help these animals regain trust in humans and the Humane Society gives them the time and space they need to come around in a way that works for them. Staff and volunteers take them for walks, play with them, and when needed, simply sit with them to give them dedicated one-on-one -on -one time. All of this is done to give the animals a second chance at life and to find them the perfect family and a loving forever home. If we feel that it is going to be a long process and they need to learn to trust someone, that would then involve a foster family and that foster family becomes the bridge potentially to being able to make connections with new people and new families. For me, fostering is great because I can get a puppy fix or a kitten fix and then I can send them back when my life gets too busy for that. And it's a wonderful way of just sort of paying it forward and um, it's, it's a feel good, it's a win-win. So about a year ago, I got a call from the Humane Society requesting whether or not we'd be interested in um, helping an older dog convalesce after hip surgery. And um, so I wasn't too sure, um, but we went and met Angel and, well, that was kind of all it took. Go get it. So I guess the couple of months stretched into a couple more months. and. At this point, we were very comfortable with her in the house, and she's kind of fit right in, so we didn't have the heart to sort of send her back and start at ground zero looking for a forever home, so we decided to keep her. Here she is. Hi, Alice. So knowing how to behave around animals will, in time, enable an animal to come around and become a normal, happy, healthy animal. What I love about animals most is they're honest and that the relationship that you have with an animal is pure. And most of the time when the relationship messes up, it isn't because of the animal, it's because of the human. And I kind of find that pureness and that kindness and that gentleness that animals bring um, something special. Uh, that's sometimes lost in our human relationships. As humans, we tend to focus on the words people use and often forget to read their body language. Animals use body language to speak to us, and when we treat them with love, gentleness, and respect, 
we can literally nurse hurting, neglected, and even abused animals back to life. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Meeting House live stream. Wherever you find yourself this morning, at whatever time you happen to be watching this, it may not even be morning by the time you're engaging with our live stream. We want to say welcome to church. My name is Carmen Bookma. I am the senior pastor here at the Meeting House. And I got to say, it's been a little while. I used to do this hosting thing a little more often. I got to say, I'm feeling a little rusty. So I'm sure that that'll be fine. It'll all come back. It's like riding a bike, isn't it? Chatting into a camera, knowing you're on the other end. But Really, for what it's worth, it's us being church together in, in all kinds of ways. And so my invitation to you, wherever you find yourself, is to settle in and let this be a time of connection and a time of church for you. There is a chat, if you're engaging with this live, to connect, ask your questions, be realizing that there's a lot of other people also doing church together this morning. And that's a fantastic space for you to participate in what's happening today. Another way that we really can connect together, if this is sort of your thing, we have a fantastic group on Discord. This is a group that connects regularly. They're vibrant, they're engaging, they're chatting, they're asking questions, they're getting to know one another. This has been a really unique space for people that call Meeting House home to connect. You can see the link there. The, op the invitation is open. Anyone and everyone is welcome to participate in a continued layer of church connection through our Discord chat. So you can head there too. But wherever you find yourself, I hope that you're experiencing the goodness of summer. All that, like we're middle of August, we know that like things are starting to wind down, the fall is coming. But I want you to invite, I want to invite you to just take a minute and just take inventory over what words you would use to define or describe your summer. What are the things that, uh, what are the things that have taken place? What are the things that you would say, this has been the goodness of the summer? And maybe on the other side, these have been the hardships of the summer. But just take a moment and pause and take inventory of where you find yourself as we connect this morning. Participating in the life of the church means like realizing that it's not all just sunshine and roses and all of the good, but it's about entering into a space into a community with who you are, as you are, where you find yourself. And so while you may have some highlights, you can throw those in the chat of the goodness of the summer. This is also a space to be, space to be authentic about the things that maybe have felt challenging or hard. And even us as a church, if you've been tracking with us or you call the Meeting House home, know that that's our story right now too. That we have some words that would define the last weeks and months as hard. But I want us to just receive and hold the truth that this is church, to come with all of who we are as we engage in a time of worship, connection together, teaching. And so you're very welcome to come into that space too. As we transition just to a giving moment, this is something that we do as a church, and this is another way we connect as community. Giving of our financial resources to the life and the work of a church is something that God invites us into as we track with him. It's not meant to be an obligation or something that feels like pressure coming from the church where you go. It's meant to be a response to the work that God is doing within you that invites you into a space of generosity to say, I recognize that I can trust what you've given me and give part of that back to the work of the church. And we're no different. And so I wanna say thank you to those that continue to faithfully give here at the Meeting House. It has allowed us to continue to do what we're doing. You can see the link there on your screen of how to learn more about giving, what that even means, and how to participate in that element of church life as well, themeetinghouse.com slash give. We're gonna enter into a time of musical worship, a time where we sing together, which I know can feel weird when we're all scattered on our couches and our homes, listening to the, this in the car. But this is a space for us to center around why we exist as a church, to center around the truth and the goodness of God. And before we do that, I want to read for us a passage of scripture. As we talk about summer and the fact that we are in the middle of August, my hope and prayer for us has been that one of your experiences this summer is a different pace, a different rhythm. Something that Jesus has been teaching me is that his pace often looks different than what the world invites us into, what expectations I even put on myself. And that's been a lesson for me this summer. And summer affords us a little bit more of that, I think. And so even as we enter into continued worship together, I want to invite us to be intentional about the pace that we set. So I want to invite you to just take a breath, take a space, 
And let's align our pacing with the presence of Jesus. I'm going to read a few chunks from two Psalms. So if you have your Bible or want to follow along, I'm going to go to one, Psalm 145 and Psalm 150. And if engaging with the Bible is new for you, the Psalms is often the space that we find that creative, artistic, poetic language, that space where the words are meant to reflect the character of God, the hardships that we find ourselves in, and the truth of who God is. And so let me read a few of the verses from Psalm 145 and then a few of the verses from Psalm 150, and let's let that be the posture within which we enter into singing and worship together today. In Psalm 145, the first few verses say this, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. Because they tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Sit slowly with the truth and the characteristics of who God is. And then I'm flipping to Psalm 150, where it talks about praising God because of these characteristics, because of everything we just said. This Psalm just says our response to that is praise. Now, the invitation in Psalm 150 may seem a little out of context. The things that they used to praise God with, we don't really use anymore. But my invitation to you is to say, what what is our compelling invitation to praise God with today? Psalm 150 says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with the timbrel and the dancing. Praise him with the strings and the pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Whatever you use, however you do it, the invitation is to let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let's enter into a time of singing with that being our pacing and our posture this morning.
Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Meeting House family. Carmen here. It's actually so fantastic to be together in this way again. It feels like it's been a little while. We're in the middle of our teaching series, which is kind of a funny title to call the series because we're it's God Only Knows. And we've been taking this month of August as your teaching team, as pastors at our local sites to just really sense, God, what are you saying to me? And speaking from that place. So it is actually quite fun and quite a privilege to kind of just respond to that with us this morning as a church to say, this is some of the stuff God has put on my heart. So you're kind of coming on a journey through my, even just my devotions and my conversations conversations with God this morning and the place that he has continually been taking me. You know when you keep asking a question hoping for maybe a different answer and then you don't get the answer you want. Kids are great at this actually. They they ask and you say no or whatever. Whatever they're hoping for they're not getting and so then they ask a different way or maybe just incessantly or if they don't get the answer they want from you they just go to the other parent. Sometimes I feel that way uh, as I'm talking with God because I'm actually just hoping for a very different answer than the one I keep getting. And that's part of my discipleship journey as I continue to mature and realize that what God is actually saying to me is something that I can trust and something that I can uh, take security in. And so the thing that I have been processing, learning about, being reminded of for a while now uh, is this idea of provision. And so that's what I wanna talk to us, <clears throat> excuse me, about this morning is this lesson of provision. And it's not lost on me that I stand here today as your senior pastor, but as one of your teaching team members. And as I wrestled with, God, what are you teaching me? So often those lessons are also intersected with what I think God is teaching me as the senior pastor, with what I think God might have to say to us as a church. So if you can like ride this wave with me of the intersection of like Carmen as a follower of Jesus and Carmen as one of your pastors and the circumstances where we find ourselves as a church, I'm really hopeful that we together continue to hear and learn about some things from Jesus. And so this idea of provision, God has reminded me of the story of the Israelites. The Israelites who, in the month of July, if you were tracking with us, we looked at the story of Moses a little bit, and that also has to do with the Israelites and taking them out of slavery into freedom. And so I'm actually still living in the book of Exodus, but the part of the story where they're not slaves in Egypt anymore, and they've actually been freed. Freed, but they're sort of not feeling the freedom yet. They're walking for years in the wilderness. And in Exodus 16 is where we're headed today because we intersect with the Israelites as they're feeling the freedom, but maybe not so much. So as a recap, or if you're not familiar with the story, the people of God, the Israelites, were in bondage to Egypt, were in oppression, were in slavery for years, and God heard their cries and freed them. It's quite a fantastic story of God's provision and power as he led them out of a land of slavery, but now they find themselves sort of walking in the wilderness a bit. I don't know if you guys, how, how much you're on social media are, but you may have seen like, it's a kind of a common trend. I don't even know if trend is the word I would use, but it's often where people post pictures where they start with like a how it started 
and then like a fast forward to how it's going. And these are sort of meant to be like a quick fast forward through a progression of time. Often it's like an upward trajectory of like, we started over here and now we're over here. So you may have seen these. I mean, I've put a few even on my own social media. So this is one I did back in June on my anniversary. So this is like the how it started. There I am, that was 16 years ago. I'd love it if you were to say, Carmen, you've hardly aged, but we all know that's not true. So let's not even pretend. Uh, this is my husband, Ben and I on our wedding uh, 16 years ago. So I posted a how it started and then a how it's going. This is us this June celebrating 16 years together. So you get the idea of the trend, right? Like a how it started, how it's going, meant to be this upward trajectory. You can probably think of some of your own examples. But sometimes the how it started versus the how it's going, it's, it's not really this direction. It may be going the other direction. So here's another example from my own uh, life of a how it started, how it's going. This was September of 2020. These are my kids, it was a few years ago. And look at them, this is the first day of school. They're eager, ready, I as a parent am eager and ready to send them out the door back to real school. Here's how it started. And then just a few months later, here's the how it's going. You don't need to read all the text. This was an Instagram post. This was like a real time moment in the middle of virtual school, in the middle of the height again of the pandemic where everything was shut down and I had to work full time, hold the house in order, and each of my kids had to engage in school online. And this moment was really, it was a, it was a recess break. But you can see like one of them's lying in the couch. One of them has a look of agony on their face. Life just felt so chaotic. The how it started to the how it's going felt a little more like a And now thankfully we're, we're through those parts of the pandemic. But I think if the Israelites had had social media back in the day, I wonder if their how it started versus how it's going would have maybe looked a little more like my last picture. Even though they had gone from slavery to freedom, we're going to see that it didn't maybe feel as free as they wanted it to. And so if you have your Bibles, we're gonna turn to Exodus 16 together. And I'm not gonna read the entire book, but we are gonna jump around a little bit within the book. I do wanna read just a few verses because I think it's really important for us as the church to sit in scripture. It's a practice that slows us down a little bit, gets our heads and hearts meditating in a space. So read with me Exodus chapter 16. I'm just gonna read um, the first eight verses and then a little bit later just to get a picture of the story. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they'd come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, oh, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. <clears throat> then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they follow my instruction. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. And so Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites in the evening, you will know it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said that you will know it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. And if we fast forward to verse 11 for a minute, it says this, then the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites, tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread, then you will know that I am the Lord your God. And it just goes on to talk about this bread, this manna that fell from heaven as a provision. And so we're gonna look at a few, a few of the intersecting points, a few of the stops along the way in the story for the Israelites, and the first place I wanna take us is verse three. And you can see, so they've come out of slavery, but what's one of the first things they say? They're grumbling and they're saying, if only. It's kind of ridiculous as you read it, the thing that they're hoping for, they're hoping for death. If only we died back there, because even that is better than what we're experiencing now. If only we died by the Lord's hand, but there at least we had food, we had security, but here we are out in this desert to starve. 
<laughs> it's, it's funny for us, we get the luxury of the whole story. And sometimes I think I would shake my head at them and be like, are you guys even, are you kidding me? You were, you were under oppression, you were under slavery. It was awful for them in Egypt. But here's the thing that's true of their circumstance and I think is true of ours sometimes too. There is comfort in the past. There is comfort in the known. And here we see their cries and laments about wanting to go back because at least they had food and security and even life. But if you go back to Exodus 2 for a minute, we can be reminded really quickly of the how it started. Exodus 2 verses 23 and to 25 say this, during that long period, so that long period when the Israelites were in slavery, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. We can quickly see how quickly they forget how much they didn't like it there either and rightly so. They were in bondage, they were in slavery, they were in death, they had a lack of provision. But how quickly, because of their circumstance, they're longing for the if only. And guys, this is the lesson that God has been teaching me as one of his kids, and maybe I think us as a church too. I confess that I often am saying, if only. And I even say it knowing, I know the character of God, I know that he has good and better ahead for me. I think back to when COVID started, what it did to us as a church, how it changed everything, how we couldn't be together, how the idea of leading and pastoring the rule book was all of a sudden thrown out the window and the amount of times I said, God, if only we could go back to when our seats were full and we could shake hands and we knew what to do. We knew what that looked like. But even in that hardship and wilderness of just not knowing, God kept saying, I'm doing a new thing. I'm taking you every day. I give you what you need. I am doing a new thing. It felt harder, but it's the way God came alongside and said, you can trust what I'm providing for you. So where in your life are you maybe in a wilderness where you find yourself saying, if only, if only I could go back to what I had? Is there a sense of a posture of grumbling, of looking back instead of looking to where God has put you now? And I wanna name your, your circumstances right now may be really hard and awful and I'm not here to say like, well, the Lord has brought you here but wherever we find ourselves, God is present and saying, trust that I have what you need for today. He is doing a new thing. And even now as a church, we are in a wilderness of sorts. I can imagine that many of us have if onlys. If only we could go back before December to the days before we had allegations and investigations or results of abuse, if only. If only we could go to the good old days. And as a church, we are now in a wilderness, but we are walking more and more in truth, even though it's harder. Those days might have felt safer, might have felt more known and more comforting, but they weren't revealing the entire truth. There were layers of abuse and dishonesty And while we may not have realized it, we weren't able to fully be the church living and walking in freedom. And so I understand and I hear and I sympathize and I'm there too of the if onlys. But can we trust that where we are right now actually holds more freedom for us and that God is with us in this moment saying, I am doing a new thing. I have never left your side. Can we trust this wilderness together? Can we lay down a posture of the grumbling if onlys and open our hands and trust that having more light, more truth, and more opportunities for healing for those that have been harmed is a good place to be. And it will lead us to more freedom. If you know the story of the Israelites, they were in the wilderness a really long time. But they got to the place that God had promised and prepared for them. So as a church, but then also for you, hear that God is doing a new thing. You can trust him in the wilderness. Don't let your if onlys, we have them, but don't let them cloud your ability to see God's provision and goodness. 
All right, I want to jump ahead a little bit to verse uh, 15. This is when God brings the manna down from heaven, and this is what the Israelites say about it. I think it's on a slide here. This is what they say. They see this bread fall from heaven, and they say, when the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Manna is actually just the Hebrew word for what is it? They'd never seen this food before. It was entirely new to them, this provision God that, that God had given them in response to their grumbling and in their longing was something that they could never have known, experienced, or asked for. It's a unique food that appeared every single morning and it would fade by noon and they had this instruction to gather what they needed for the day. Scripture tells us a few verses uh, earlier, I think in verse 12, that it, it was made and tasted like wafers made with honey. And God told them that it was coming. God told them actually in verse 12, that's what it says, in the morning you will be filled with bread. He told them what was coming and when it came they said, what, what is this? God provides, God provides what they needed and in response to what they cried out for. And this idea of what is it, I wanna land here for a minute and say we may not fully understand the provisions that God has for us. This has been a life lesson for me that I don't always recognize the provision that God has put before me, but it's there and oftentimes it's new and it's often something I would have never thought to ask for because I haven't needed it before. Couldn't even imagine that it's what that God wanted for me. The Israelites called out to go back to what they had in Egypt and God said, I'm going to provide for you, but it's not going to be that because I have something better for you. And it was manna that fell from heaven and God's provision brings life and it brings sustenance. And when it is in, it's there for me, it moves me along day by day. Can I look at us to, uh, can I encourage us to look at the good things that are around us, the things that are sustaining us and start to see that perhaps this is God's provision for us today. This has been a lesson for me. My prayer has often been, God, what are the next weeks gonna bring? What are the next months gonna bring? How do I lead? How do I pastor? How do I be a disciple of yours like for the next year? And this is that part where God just gives me an answer that like I keep going back and hoping for a different answer, but he just says, how about you look at today? My provision for you today is enough. What God has provided for me today has sustained me and it shows me his character of goodness and presence with us. I think sometimes when we hear wilderness, we associate it with a lack, with a hard, and it is, but we assume that this is the place of depletion, of sorrow, of not enough. And I want us to see that in the story of the Israelites today as they wandered in the the wilderness, perhaps it's actually a story of abundance. Every single day, they had enough for what they needed and hear today that there is a provision for you and it may not feel like it because you might be looking at the week or the month or the year saying there's no way. Pull that back to what God is doing for you right now today and is it enough for what you need? God is with you and he is providing for you like he did for the Israelites even though they didn't recognize it. What is it? And every day it came and it sustained them. And then there was the instruction to, to not keep it until morning. And that's where we're going to head next in, verses, in verse 19. This was the instruction from God and Moses passed it on to the Israelites that said, no one is to keep any of it until the morning. Man, were they learning a hard lesson about daily provision. And I am also learning a hard lesson about being satisfied and still with God in what is coming for today. The instruction is to take what they need and when they didn't do this, it doesn't last, which is such a human reaction and intuition. Uh, So if we look here at verse 20, so Moses says in verse 19, just take what you need for today. Do not keep any of it till morning. The very next verse, we read this in verse 20. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry at them. But isn't this just so natural to who we are. It feels wise, it feels logical, it feels protective. We're in the wilderness, there's not enough. Let's do what we can to preserve, to hold on to what we think we need to hold on to. And I think one of the hardest lessons for the Israelites and often a hard lesson for me is to say, I've given you what you need for today. Can you trust me that today is for today and tomorrow will be for tomorrow 
and the next day will be the next day. You would think that by now, if you read the story of the Israelites in Egypt, they were like shown miracle after miracle after provision after provision. The story of them leaving is Egypt is wild. It's wild, if you know it, you know that there was plague after plague given to the Egyptians. They were freed, they were rescued. The Red Sea parted so that they could leave freely and be cut off from their captors. And yet here they are saying, I don't know if I can trust that. I better keep enough for tomorrow. And they took matters into their own hands. But even when they did that, in God's goodness, the provision didn't stop. God was faithful to give it to them every single day. And they did it for many, many years, but it's what carried them forward and served as the testimony of God's goodness. And so let's talk about us, the whole idea of don't keep it until morning. What is our clenched fist? Where are we clinging when God has asked us to open our hands? Where are we holding on to every possible strand of comfort? There is comfort in the known and there's often comfort in the past. Where are we clinging when God has asked us to open our hands and just be ready to trust in his goodness and his provision for what is right before us? So often this feels more comfortable for me because it feels like I'm clinging to the things that I often cling to are clarity uh, and answers to questions that I'm hoping for, doing things the way I used to always do them. Uh, But what I'm missing out on when I do this is the invitation from God to uh, trust, but to move forward with a courage that I won't know because I actually feel like I have enough like this. This feels comfortable to me, it feels secure. And what is God saying? If you just did this, there would be a new thing for you today. As we become a fuller version of ourselves as a church, we have to do the brave work of letting go of the little bits that only brings maggots. It's a lovely picture, isn't it? That only brings a rot. It's when we daily open our hands and say, okay, that was good for yesterday. That was a beautiful provision for yesterday, but what today, Jesus, do you have for me? And it might look like yesterday's. God will be speaking to you as you walk with him, the things that he's providing in your life, caring for you with, but the posture of saying, I'm here to receive what you have for me today and trust that it might look different than yesterday. I trust I might not even know to ask for it. Friends, we are in the wilderness. I've heard it from so many of you. We're tired, we're frustrated, we're hurt. We think we're moving too slowly. We're fed up with the unknowns. And then we have that in our own personal lives too. But for us, there is daily provision. God has never taken me a day without giving me what I need. And yet every morning I wake up a little bit anxious, not sure how the day will play out. You think I would learn by now. God is giving us everything we need to get to today. And then the second reflection question is this, what areas have you not recognized that this is our daily provision? Because we're doing this, maybe we don't see that God has actually graciously given us something. So just wanna pause and, and as we start to end this morning, to start to say, take an inventory for a moment of where you can go back and see how God has provided for you. In your past home, if you're in home church through the summer, or even if you're not, I'd encourage you to look at the questions. This is one of those questions. What are some of the stories you have of the ways God has provided? And how can you apply that to where you are right now to say, I can see God's provision from yesterday or today? Where are we trying to kind of clench our hands with what's in front of us? And where is God saying, hey, I have a new thing for you? You can see those reflection questions. Okay, as we, as we wrap up, I wanna kind of introduce, you may know this idea, this term, or maybe you don't, it's dayenu, dayenu. This is a, f- a phrase, it's actually a song in the Jewish tradition that would have been sung during their celebration of Passover. Passover is the, tr- the festival that celebrates the story of the Israelites being brought to freedom. The first Passover happened in the Exodus story and they've celebrated it as a people ever since. And this is a song that is sung, Dayenu, and the concept of it, the concept of the word is it would have been enough. It would have been enough. And the idea of the song is as they look at the story of God leading them out, even if God had only done this or that or the other, it would have been enough because 
It's almost like you can translate this to say God's goodness is enough. And even as I prepared today, I I honestly transparently wrestled a little bit with this concept of, I don't wanna stand up here and say to you guys, you know what, you're fine. I don't know what hardships you're going through. I don't know what your wilderness looks like, but don't worry, God provides. Because the hard truth is, as we look at our world, is there seemingly are people that do not have the provision that they need. There are people that are starving. There are people that are on the margins continually. And so the last thing I'd want you to hear from this is like, don't worry about your hardship, God's gonna provide. The story of the Israelites in the wilderness, the story of Exodus 16, the story of provision is this idea of enough that God has said, I will provide for you enough. Don't hoard it. Don't keep it till morning. If you trust me daily, there is enough. And the Jewish people have this beautiful tradition of dayenu to say it would have been enough. If God had only led us out of Egypt and we'd walked by ourselves, it still would have been enough. And that is true of us today too, that when we talk about God's provision, well, yes, he will provide tangibly what we need. The real lesson is is that we are provided by God's goodness. The character of God in our lives is very present. If you continue to read through the story of the Israelites, that there's this theme through the whole of them walking in the wilderness of the presence of God. It went before them, it's what led them. He never, ever left them. Despite their grumbling, despite their disobedience, despite their blatant turning away from him and their sin, he never left them because God is good in his character. And that is our provision. God will provide what we need today and God will provide what you need tomorrow. And it's his goodness that lets that happen. And it is enough for you. So that's a little bit about where God has been leading me and taking me and the lesson he says to me. If we go back to the beginning when I say I keep asking God the same question, often I'm asking for a provision that lasts a lot longer than what day. And I often do a reflection exercise at the end of each day to just go over my day. How did it go? Where did I not, wasn't aware of Jesus? When did I blatantly disobey him? Where was he with me? And something that he has said to me gently almost every single day is, I gave you what you needed for today. And I'd like to stand here and say I'm learning from that. I'm learning to have a uh, anxiety-free pastoring and leadership and discipleship journey. And yet most mornings I wake up thinking, I don't know how I'm gonna do this today. And yet God in his goodness and God in his provision and the God who puts up with my grumbling if onlys And the God who's so patient with me that I don't even recognize the provision that's right in front of me says, I gave you what you needed today. And he does the same for you too. Let me pray for us. Jesus, we thank you for your presence in our life and in our midst. Thank you that there is story after story in your scripture of your goodness. And God, as a human race, as human beings, our propensity and our leaning so often is to forget that goodness. I pray for, uh, our church. I pray for your people at our church who are in a wilderness. Would you give us by your grace an ability to remember, an ability to see that even when we're in wildernesses of all kinds, your presence is right there with us, your goodness is right there with us, and you are sustaining us, giving us life every single day. We thank you that you are a good God. We pray this in your name. Amen.
Amen. This is where you, from where you are, say amen. Uh, what a beautiful way to end in a time of musical worship. I pray and have been praying that your experience of church this morning is one where you have heard from and experienced the goodness of God. Far more than any of the words I might have said in the teaching or in this time or even the songs that were sung, the slickness and the excellence with which they were done, the point and the hope is that you're inter intersecting with and experiencing the voice of Jesus. And so pay attention to that. Before we rush into the rest of our day, our prayer has been that you would, you would hear from him. And so pay attention to if there's, a, there's something standing out, something that did stick with you from something from this morning or a sense within you that you need to pay attention to. Often that's how the spirit works in connecting with us. And that's no different for you. You're not disqualified from hearing from Jesus. And my hope and prayer is that that is for you today. And as I talked about at the beginning, part of the heart and the hope of church is connection. And we want that to continue. If you're in need of prayer or want to just connect, you can head to some of the places on our website, themeetinghouse.com slash connect, themeetinghouse.com slash prayer. Those are spaces to start. Home church is another expression for us of being community, of actually like getting away from the screen and finding the people in person. Or we do have some online home churches as well, but it's just a space to be authentic and connect. You can see the link there, themeetinghouse.com slash home church. We want to make this a space where you say, if this is my church, I am known and I know others to the degree that you want. I hope that you have a fantastic Sunday and that you experience the pace of Jesus in whatever this week holds for you. Have a great day.